take a break from the Gyoji chapter and uh, talk about something different. Uh, probably you already got um, uh, the screenshots I sent you about three pages uh, from a book of Thomas Merton. Uh, I think the title is New Seeds of Contemplation. Um, anybody here who has never heard about Thomas Merton? Oh, oh. Mm -hmm. So only Edward knows who yeah. Thomas Merton is. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, surprised because I, he used to be quite famous in the Western meditation scene. Um, so... When did he die? Around in the early 1970s or so? Maybe 76 or so. I'm, I'm sure there's a, a Wikipedia page, uh, page on, on Thomas Merton. Well, he's famous because he started out <coughs> as a, a Catholic priest. I forgot which order. But uh, as a Catholic monastic and also started to write books on uh, Catholic uh, monasticism and contemplation in the Catholic um, tradition. And I think this book where these screenshots are from are one of his earlier works from the 1940s or so, I think, uh, or maybe early 50s. And then uh, later in his life, he became interested in Buddhism and he also had a uh, friendship with Viti Suzuki and uh, was one of the first um, Catholics that were kind of actively um, seeking an exchange with uh, Buddhists. Uh, monks and Buddhist uh, meditators. In Germany, there's quite a few Catholics who are into meditation, or actually the first people in Germany that um, taught Zen uh, were Catholics, like the most famous is a guy called uh, Lassalle, no, uh, Lassalle. 
uh, Pata La Salle, who uh, came to Japan I think in the 1920s and uh, in 1945 when the atom bomb dropped on Hiroshima he was quite close to the epicenter at the time so he survived the Hiroshima atomic bomb and after that he got interested in Zen and actually was somehow I think an authorized Zen master and at the same time a Catholic monk and uh, most of the year he lived in Japan, but he also went back to Germany at least once a year to teach Zen in Germany. And right now there's a few uh, Catholic priests that are active as Zen teachers in Germany. And I think much more Catholics that are interested in uh, Zen. For some reason, much more Catholics than Protestant Christians, um, as far as I can judge. And Thomas Merton is an example of an American, or I think he was born as an Englishman. He, so he was an Englishman, um, but then uh, he went to America to become a Catholic monk. So he was most of the time most active in America and I think he died in Bangkok uh, where he was to participate in this, some kind of an, a conference of religious leaders and I think he was how do you say electrolyted there was some some electric fan or so that fell in his bathtub I think and there's even some rumors that he was killed by the Vatican or so that there was a, a plot to kill him so because he was drifting too much in the Buddhist direction, but I think he was just not careful enough and this fan dropped into the bathtub when he was having a bath and he died. Um, anyway, so Thomas Merton seemed, uh, used to be quite popular in the um, meditation scene in the West. Um, in the 70s and also still in the 80s when I got into uh, Zazen. And uh, among these screenshots which I sent you, probably the most famous part is starts at the end of page 194. The most dangerous man in the world is the contemplative who is guided by nobody. He trusts his own visions. He obeys the attractions of an interior voice, but will not listen to other men. He identifies the will of God with anything that makes him feel within his own heart a big, warm, sweet interior glow. And if you Google for the first two or three sentences, uh, you find these quoted all over the net <coughs> in uh, a lot of different contexts. And a lot of people take what Merton is saying here in a positive sense. And I think uh, if you look only at this quote, it actually sounds quite cool what he says here about the contemplative being the most dangerous man in the world, being even more dangerous than, say, Che Guevara or um, whoever could be there, um, because he's guided by nobody. So he doesn't allow anybody to brainwash him. All of us others are brainwashed by the media, brainwashed by commercials by the internet but if you become able to yeah be so self-reliant that you're guided by nobody then you become actually the most dangerous man in the world you trust your own visions. Um, so who is guiding you then? Um, and that's then the third sentence. You obey the attractions of an interior voice. 
rather than listening to other men. And there is within your own heart a big, warm, sweet interior glow, which you identify with the, God, with the will of God. So realize that God is not something out there, far from you, above the clouds, but you discover God in yourself. And it's not just an abstract idea. But you can actually feel the God, the will of God in yourself, and it feels, well, big, warm, and sweet, and it's glowing. Um, but then uh, when you continue to read, uh, you realize that Thomas Merton is aiming at something else here, is trying to say something else that at first sight he seems to say. Mm, the sweeter and the warmer the feeling is, the more he is convinced of his own infallibility. And if the sheer force of his own self-confidence communicates itself to other people and gives them the impression that he is really a saint, such a man can wreck a whole city or religious order or even a nation. The world is covered with scars that have been left in its flesh by visionaries like these. However, very often these people are nothing more than harmless bores. They have wandered into a spiritual blind alley and there they rest in a snug little nest of private emotions. No one else can really bring himself either to invite or admire them because even those who know nothing of the spiritual life can somehow sense that these are men who have cheated themselves out of reality and have come to be content with a fake. They seem to be happy, but there's nothing inspiring or contagious about their happiness. They seem to be at peace, but their peace is hollow and restless. They have much to say, and everything they say is a message with a capital N. And yet it, is con yet, and yet it convinces nobody. Because they have preferred pleasure and emotion to the austere sacrifices imposed by genuine faith, their souls have become stagnant. The flame of true contemplation has gone out. When you are led by God into the darkness where contemplation is found, you are not able to rest in the false weakness of your own will. The fake interior satisfaction of self-complacency and absolute confidence in your own judgment in your own judgment, will never be able to deceive you entirely. Entirely, It will make you slightly sick and you will be forced by a vague sense of interior nausea to gash yourself open and let the poison out. In order to understand the true value of spiritual obedience, we must be very careful to distinguish between self-will and genuine liberty. This distinction is a matter of great importance because we are called to freedom under obedience and not to the mere sacrifice of all freedom in order to respond to authority like machines. The highest freedom is found in obedience to God. The loss of freedom lies in subjection to the tyranny of autom automatism whether in the capricious uh, capriciousness of our own self-will or in the blind dictates of despotism, convention, routine, or mere collective inertia. One of the most common of illusions is that by asserting my own caprices against the dictates of authority. I am manifesting my own freedom. I am acting spontaneously, in quotation marks. This is not true spontaneity. 
and it does not lead to general freedom. It is license rather than liberty. Of course, even this imperfect spontaneity may be in itself preferable to the dead routine of passive conventionalism. But this should not keep us from seeing its obvious limitations. And this is where the screenshots end, I think. And, well, maybe I'll also read the part that comes before the famous quotes, starting uh, on page 192. Far from being essentially opposed to each other, interior contemplation and external activity are two aspects of the same love of gods. But the activity of contemplative of a contemplative must be born of his contemplation and must resemble it. Everything, everything he does outside of contemplation ought to reflect the luminous tranquility of his interior life. To this end he will have to look for the same thing in his activity as he finds in his contemplation, contact and union with God. No matter how little you may have learned of God in prayer, Compare your acts with that little, order them by that measure. Try to make all your activity bear fruit in the same emptiness and silence and detachment you have found in contemplation. Ultimately, the secret of all, of all this perfect abandonment to the will of God in things you cannot control and perfect obedience to him in everything that depends on your own volition, so that in all things, in your interior life and in your outward works for God, you desire only one thing, which is the fulfillment of his will. If you do this, your activity will share the disinterest, disinterested peace that you are able to find at prayer and in the simplicity of the things you do men will recognize your peacefulness and will give glory to god it is above all in the silent and unconscious testimony to the love of god that the contemplative exercises his apostolate for the saint preaches sermons by the way he walks and the way he stands, and the way he sits down, and the way he picks things up and holds them in his hand. The perfect do not have to reflect on the details of their actions. Less and less conscious of themselves, they finally cease to be aware of themselves doing things. And gradually God begins to do all that they do in them and for them, at least in the sense that the habit of his love has become second nature to them and informs all that they do with his likeness. Maybe first uh, about this first part. Um, Merton, he talks about two aspects of what we would call practice. Uh, contemplation, which in our case would be Zazen, sitting still, uh, doing nothing for an hour and then getting up to walk quietly for 10-15 minutes and then sit down for another hour. And sometimes we do that for five days in a row. But then uh, there is uh, cleaning, uh, there's samu to be done, work to be done. Um, sometimes there's a study group like this. And uh, Merton says these are two aspects of the same love of God. So it's not that one is more important than the other. And sometimes in, in Zen there's a discussion about, well, which in the end is more fundamental. Is uh, Zazen more basic and we only do Samu to support our practice of Zazen? But it would be ideal if we could spend the whole year 
doing a session and uh, somebody else would do the work for us. <clears throat> or sometimes, especially in Rinza, it says that actually Samu is thousand times more uh, important than Zazen because in Zazen sometimes you only think that you're practicing while in fact you're only dreaming while in Samu you have to be in the moment or it's obvious if you're not um, but I think the the common understanding in Zen is that actually the 24 hours of the day are practice and in each moment you do basically what you do and if you sit you sit if you eat you eat if you take a shit you take a shit and it's all the same practice um, we don't talk about God so much in Zen or basically not at all <clears throat> but what he's saying here um, talks about contact and union with God um, ultimately the secret of all this is the perfect abon abandonment to the will of God in things you cannot control and perfect obedience to him in everything that depends on your own volition so that in all things uh, that now that's at the top of page 193 so that in all things in your interior life and in your outward works for God, you desire only one thing, which is the fulfillment of his will. If you do this, your activity will share the disinterested peace that you are able to find in prayer and in the simplicity of the things you do. Men will recognize your peacefulness and will give glory to God. It is above all in the silent and unconscious testimony to the love of God. God that the contemplative exercises his apostolate. Um, for the saint preaches sermons by the way he walks and the way he stands and the way he sits down and the way he picks things up and holds them in his hand. Um, basically what Merton is talking about here is what in Zen in Japanese we call Mui and in Chinese it's Wu Wei, non-doing. Um, Non-doing, of course, doesn't mean that you don't do anything, but whatever you do, I think in somewhere in the other, other practice uh, um, papers, I say, let the walk walk, let the talk talk, something like that. Um, if you do cleaning, it's, it's soji itself that's doing soji. When you do zazen, zazen does zazen. Um, in Samu, sometimes you get to the point where you don't have to think anymore about what you do, but basically you do what you do, what you need, what needs to be done in that moment. Or sometimes when you're a tenzo and you're very busy, you get to the point where your hands and feet, they just move and they do everything just in the right way so that lunch is on the table at 12 o'clock. Um, I think that's what he's talking about, um, just following the will of God. We wouldn't use that expression, but sometimes there's this condition where things just take care of themselves. And it's not that like you're acting like a robot in the sense that you would be lifeless. You're completely aware and present in that moment. But hmm, in a way, you could also say that there's something else that's taking control of you. So sometimes people, when they talk about mindfulness, they say, um, we live our ordinary lives in this autopilot mode. <clears throat> and what they, I think they try to say is that when you're in this autopilot mode is that you're, I don't know what the pilots do in the cockpit when, when the plane is flying into autopilot, maybe they're chatting with each other, so maybe they're holding a nap. Um, basically, the, the, 
the computer in the cockpit is taking care that the plane is flying in the right direction at the right height at the right speed. Um, so the pilots don't have to be so aware in that moment. Still, sometimes when I hear this expression that you are living your life in autopilot, it reminds me of this feeling, for example, when the Zen is doing the Zen. Um, it's like sitting the Zen in autopilot, but what is different is you're completely aware at that moment. It's just that you give control to the Zen. It's not that you try to control the Zen. And the same can happen during Tenzo or Samu or Soji, whatever. Um, obvious examples when you're taking a shit and, and sometimes uh, maybe you've got constipation. It does, you're, you're doing your best to get it out. You, but then you just have to let go in that moment. <laughs> things take care of themselves and sometimes in other aspects of life it works the same you're trying your best and and you, you make a big effort and you still can't do it and the moment you let go you realize oh especially like in in, in the zen what what dogen zenji calls shinjin datsu like letting go of body and mind is a little bit like this moment where where you were constipated and then there's this moment of release and whew, Something drops. Can happen in the Zen as well. Um, I think that's what Merton calls here with the following the will of God. <clears throat> and also, um, we haven't read that in a while in Antaji, but sometimes in the winter uh, we study the Tenzo Kyokun, and other winters we study the Chijishingi, the standards monastic standards for the Zen community is I think the English translation we have it in the library and somewhere there is an exchange between was it Chakujo? maybe um, there's a visitor that comes to Chakujo a famous Chinese monk who lived more than a thousand years ago he's well he's famous for saying a day without work is a day without food um, so sometimes he's credited with starting the self-sufficient style of living then practice so this visitor comes to Chakujo and says i know this very auspicious mountain i think the name was isan uh, that's the name of the mountain. And if someone would buy, uh, would uh, build a monastery on that mountain, I'm sure lots of people would come there to practice. Um, Shakujo, do you know anybody who would be capable of building a monastery on that mountain? And Shakujo says, well, how about me? And the visitor says, well, you're a little bit old. Uh, maybe somebody younger than you would be better. Um, and then Shakujo calls the first monk. And the visitor says, well, can you take a few steps and uh, clear your throat? And uh, the first monk takes a few steps and clears his throat. And the visitor says, no, that, that person is no good. And next, uh, Shakujo calls the Tenzo, the cook. And... He does the same and the visitor says, oh, that's the, that's the person, that's the guy we were looking for. The first monk later is then very, um, well, angry or his pride is hurt. How can you judge me and the Tenzo just by having us walk a few steps and clearing our throats? Um, and then Shakujo says, well, if you say that... Um, let's take a second test and he puts a, a vase or something in front of the two people and says well um, how would you call this object without calling it a vase and the first monk says well you can't call it a cup of tea and Chakujo just kicks it with, kicks it with his foot and, um, then 
both Gyakujo and the visitor agree that it's the Tenzo. Uh, it's not Gyakujo who kicks it, the Tenzo. I think uh, Isan Lehu also was later his name. Maybe I get the names wrong. But anyway, the the cook just kicks the vase all over the place and, and he gets he gets the job. So he gets the job of building a monastery on that mountain. Um, so often it's enough to just look at a person, how he sits, how he stands, uh, how he's cleaning the floor. And often the attitude with which a person does something teaches much more than what that person has to say when he's sitting in the spot and gives a wrinkle talk or whatever. Um, yeah, so uh, Merton uses different expressions than we usually have in Zen. Uh, but basically what he's talking about here is, is uh, non-doing. The extreme difficulties, now I'm reading the end at the bottom of uh, page 193. The extreme difficulties that lie in the way of those who seek interior freedom and purity of love soon teach them that they cannot advance by themselves. And the spirit of God gives them a desire for the simplest means of overcoming their own selfishness and blindness of judgment. And this is obedience to the judgment and guidance of another. A spirit that is drawn to God in contemplation will soon learn the value of obedience. The hardship and anguish he has to suffer every day from the burden of his own selfishness, his clumsiness, incompetence and pride will give him a hunger to be led and advised and directed by somebody else. His own will becomes the source of so much misery and so much darkness that he does not go to some other man merely to seek light or wisdom or counsel. He comes to have a passion for obedience itself and for the renunciation of his own will and of his own lights. Therefore, he does not obey his abbot or his director merely because the commands or the advice given to him seem good and profitable and intelligent in his own eyes. He does not obey just because he thinks the abbot makes him admir makes admirable decisions. On the contrary, sometimes the decisions of his superior seem to be less wise. But with this, he is no longer concerned because he accepts the superior as a mediator between him and God and rests only in the will of God as it comes to him through the men that have been placed over him by the circumstances of his vocation. And now this connects to the famous quote about the most dangerous man. It's clear that Merton's idea of a contemplator, meditator, is different. So that for him, obedience is central. Um, and this connects, uh, for example, to what uh, Dogen says at the end of uh, Shobo Genzo Zimonki, at least in the edition that we usually um, read. It's the very last chapter. Uh, let me see if I can find it quickly here on the internet. As you probably know, you can find it on the Soto Zen. Um, I'm it's 6.17 and I'm reading here from the internet. Shobogenzo Zimonki, book 6, chapter 17. Dogen instructed, uh, there's a proverb about the emperor, about the way of the emperor. 
If one's heart is not empty, not empty, it is impossible to accept loyal advice. What this means is that without holding personal views, one follows the opinions of loyal ministers and carries out the way of the sovereign according to how things should be. The attitude of Zen monks practicing the way should be the same. If you hold on to personal views, even slightly, the words of your teacher will not enter your ears. If you don't listen to your teacher's words, you cannot grasp your teacher's dharma. Forget not only the different views on the dharma, but also worldly affairs and hunger and cold as well. When you listen, being completely purified in body and mind, you will be able to hear intimately. When you listen with this attitude, you will be able to clarify the truth and resolve your questions. True attainment, true attainment of the way is casting aside body and mind and following your teacher directly. If you maintain this attitude, you will be a true person of the way. This is a primary secret. And Dogen says uh, pretty much the same in the last chapter of the Gakudo Yojinshu. Um, which we also, we have lots of copies of an English translation, I think it's called Heart of Zen, in the library. There's 10 chapters of the Gakudo Yojinshu, and in the last, um, he also says, talks about casting aside body and mind. And here the translation is following your teacher directly um, in the original Japanese, the, the character there is not teacher, but it's just ta, which means the other or the others. Um, so basically you don't follow your own views, but you follow what the other person says. <coughs> but then again, This also has something frightening. Somewhere in, in the Zui Monkey also, or maybe it was the Gakudo Yojinsho, there's also this uh, expression of the old nest. And, and Merton, interestingly, he, he uses the same expression here. Um, of the old nest that one falls. That's the old nest of your own uh, opinions, views. Um, well, I don't know about how you how you read this, but it has something frightening. This um, insistence on obedience, and as he says there, you don't obey. You're not supposed to obey the abbot or the superiors because what they say is wise or intelligent, but just out of a desire for obedience itself. Um, frightening because, for example, in Germany we have the history of uh, Nazism, National Socialism, and the reason why that was possible at the time is because people obeyed their superiors, and probably a large percentage of the population were aware that what was going on was not right. It's just that if I alone resist, it would cost my life and wouldn't change anything. So what other choice do I have to just follow along and obey the orders? And that's how war starts. So, um, Merton's insistence on obedience just for the sake of obedience, even when you realize that what your superior says is maybe not so wise in the end, it has something frightening. So, 
I guess it needs to be balanced with a certain, well, wisdom on your side, or first of all, that's also something Godogen Zenji mentions or emphasizes in the Gaku do Yojinshu. You need to be sure that you're studying with the right teacher in the first place. So, so you need to first make sure that you're putting your trust in the right person. Mm. On the other hand, if each time your teacher says something that doesn't really fit with your own personal views and you get out your yardstick and, and, and decide, is this really what I want to do or is it not what I want to do? You will never finally be able to let go of that yardstick, which practice is all about, to once and for all let go this grip of my yardstick and this is what I think is right and what I think is wrong and this is what I want to do. If you don't let that go, non-doing cannot happen. It's, there will always be this you that does things or that decides this is what I want to do, this is what I decide I'm not going to do. Um, You need at one point to let go of that. And if you have the guidance of another, it makes it much easier. Um, maybe once more to this quote about the most dangerous man in the world. <clears throat> the most dangerous man in the world is the contemplative who is guided by nobody. He trusts his own. Oh, I have problems with this computer. Um, he trusts his own vision, I think. He trusts his own visions. He obeys the attractions of an interior voice, but will not listen to other men. Mm. All of you have seen the movie Matrix, The Matrix, yeah. Um, I saw it probably was not so long after it came out at the end of the 90s uh, in a plane from Japan to America. So I wasn't so focused and I was tired, um, but the beginning I found interesting. I got bored when all these these kung fu scenes started. Um, but uh, the beginning, this idea that you're living in a reality that's not really real. What you think is reality is not really real. You're living inside an illusion. It has something. It has parallels to lots of, of religions and philosophies. But there's also this parallel to to Buddhism that you're you're basically living in an illusion. Uh, you know, or uh, uh, Sawaki Roshi also talks a lot about this this group uh, paralysis. We're, we're living in this illusion that we share with everybody else. So there's this guy. I forgot the setup, but at one point uh, he has to choose between two pills: a red pill and a blue pill. And uh, the red pill will make him wake up from delusion, and the blue pill will make him forget everything that happened, and he's gonna go back into this uh, illusion. And I think they even tell him that he might be even happier if he returns to illusion, takes the blue pill and, and turns, returns to delusion. But then he decides to take the red pill and he sees that um, he had been a slave to, well, the matrix, basically. And the matrix we could identify in Buddhism with delusion. He had been a slave to it his delusions until then and he wasn't even aware of that he th thought he was in control of his life when he in fact he was a slave and but then he wakes up but he sees that all his fellow men are still in the de illusion trapped in a delusion without realizing it and um, what i found a little bit how do you say well missing 
in that movie was, um, well, I talked about that also on, on, on YouTube, but on, I think only in German uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, ten years before The Matrix came out, uh, there was a movie with Schwarzenegger called Total Recall. Do you know that? Um, which is, well, it's a Schwarzenegger movie, so it's a lot of also action and fighting going on. What I loved about this movie is there's also the setup. There's this guy totally brainwashed and thinking or well, living an identity that's not his real identity. And at one point he wakes up to this fact that, or, or well, at first he just thinks I need to go to Mars, Mars to planet Mars for, for some reason. Um, but then he realizes the woman that he thought he wa was his girlfriend is not really his girlfriend, it's an agent that's basically spying on him. And um, he was trapped on Mars, uh, not on Mars, on, on, on Earth. Uh, for some reason, people didn't want him to go to Mars. And when he goes to Mars, he um, meets his former friends who are basically rebels on Mars. They're fighting the system. They're fighting the um, people on Earth that try to colonize and control Mars. So, so he was one of the rebels on Mars that fought for the independency of uh, Mars. He meets these friends again and they uh, somehow they remove this <coughs> whatever was plucked into his head or whatever um, they succeed in removing the, the the brainwashing process so he's basically in that situation where he has taken the red pill and he's walking up he's, he's seen through the whole delusion and he's back into his real self but then there's this, this interesting turnaround when I think he gets, I forgot the details, but he gets caught again by these colonizers from Earth. <coughs> and hey, don't you remember who you are? Oh, I see these guys, these rebels on Mars, they brainwashed you. <coughs> they made you think that you're one of these rebels. Uh, why don't you sit on this chair and we, we remove that bug that they put into your brain? And that. So basically the Schwarzenegger is in that situation where it's not clear anymore. Is the red pill the real pill? Is the blue pill the real pill? How can I be sure that the first brainwashing was actually a brainwashing or, or maybe, maybe the second brainwashing when I thought that I woke up from the brainwashing maybe that was the actual brainwashing and so what I would have wanted in the Matrix movie is that at one point uh, this this I think Neo character and, and all his friends should have asked themselves oh maybe we are the guys who are living in the illusion who knows if maybe actually the red pill was the drug. Um, how can we be so sure? And that question is especially well relevant today. And in the end of the 90s, kind of terrorism wasn't a big topic yet, but until after 2001. Um, being a minority that's fighting for the independence of your state or your group, whatever you are. Um, in the 80s, in the 90s, that was still cool, but today you have the Islamic State, or, or I think they have a hard time now, but uh, Islamic State, I think, attracted especially these people who thought we don't want to be slaves anymore of global capitalism and the rule of the Christian capitalist Western world. We want to fight that system. We want to fight this 
global matrix. Um, but from the outside perspective, well, they are the ones that are brainwashed. But from their perspective, we are probably, we will live in global capitalism. We are the ones who are brainwashed. And at the end of the day, it's hard to tell. It's really hard to tell. Um, anyway, Merton warns here against trusting your own visions and nothing but your own visions. I mean, Dogen Zenji also in the Zui Monk, he warns against following the, well, the ideas of right and wrong that people in the world have. But then the question is, well, what do you follow then? if you're also not supposed to follow your own ideas. Um, <coughs> one reason I'm saying this, or actually I gave more or less uh, the same talk already three years ago. So when not, none of you were here, I was, um, giving more or less the same talk because I had the feeling at the time that some people at Antaiji are very serious about practice and they have a very also maybe clear idea what practice is about, what they want to do here. But sometimes it's just a little bit off. Like, there's this, well, type of practitioner who want to meditate as much as possible. And in Antaiji, well, you have these 1,800 hours of the Zen, so that's great. And during the winter when there's no Samu, they would maybe also sit in their room and meditate uh, by themselves. And maybe even during Samu, they would try as good as possible to concentrate on their breath during some, so that they stay focused and don't lose sight of their selves. So uh, they might weed the carrots, but would try to not get lost in this discriminative thinking of this is a carrot, this is a wheat, but rather stay focused on, on breathing in and breathing out. And from the outside, sometimes it seems that this person, well, it's obvious they are really serious and they are aiming at something there, but well, they're not really connected with the work, especially when you look at them doing Samu or Soji, they're not really connected with the work. They're, they're, they're some, some, their mind is somewhere else. Um, in, in, Jap in Japanese, there's uh, this expression, bo tosuru, or boke tosuru, which means to be, what do you say in English? Well, it's, it's well, maybe also absent-minded, absent but, but 
Well, the funny thing is, is that these people probably think that they are the least absent-minded. They're the most mind. They they actually actively trying to be as mindful <coughs> as possible in each moment. It's just that their idea of mindfulness means that well, they they put their mind, for example, on the breath or whatever practice they do and it's not well where the carrots grow mm, and when somebody tell the tells them then hey hey maybe you should well practice here with the rest of us for them, it's more a disturbance of their practice. Mm. Or that there's the story of the guy who was given the task to weed the carrot <coughs> fields. At the end of the day, he had removed all of the weeds, but all of the carrots as well. And uh, the responsible for the vegetable field was angry and yelled at him uh, so so what are we supposed to, to to eat during the next winter and he said why are you so attached <laughs> uh, aren't, aren't, we, well, aren't we supposed to let go and, and you're still caught in your discriminated discriminated thinking and in a, in a way of course well he's true i mean we've left secular life and because we want to get out of this what can i gain i don't want to lose i want to gain i don't want to lose um so why should we worry about the shika getting into the rice field or the vegetable fields i mean if they get into the vegetable field or the rice field and they eat something, then we lose something, they gain something. So, so where's the problem? Uh, why make so much fuss about checking the fence each night? But then there's the reality of life here at Antaiji. And although it's not a bit about individual gain and loss, uh, to be able to sit on the cushion for 1,800 hours, somebody has to put the meals on the table. And uh, the food has to grow in the fields. Um, <coughs> so, also three years ago, I had the feeling there's sometimes people at Antaiji that probably feel a very big, warm glow in their heart and they follow that but it's somehow leading them a little bit off uh, in a different direction from the rest of the sangha but whenever somebody including myself tries to tell them hey you're not really here that probably sounds to them just like white noise kind of something that's pulling them out of this feeling of being in the here and now for them they are always in the here and now and it's this well useless task of having to separate the carrots from the weeds and removing the one and leaving the other and uh, making the tour around the electric fence and making sure that the shikas don't come in. Um, that's actually disturbing their practice. Um, there is a person that probably none of you or maybe <laughs> Eko san knows him, but I doubt that the rest of you have heard about him. Well, in Japanese or in Japan, he's quite famous in the spiritual community. 
Ah, you, the dragon. You no skip. Um, I'm not quite sure how old he is now. He's younger than myself. And well, the kind of interesting thing, he's he was born. Um, or his father uh, took over a Pure Land temple, Jodo Shin Shu temple in Yamaguchi. And uh, so, as the son of the temple priest, um, he was supposed to take over that Jodo Shin temple, which he was also going to do. And Jodo Shin Buddhism, Pure Land Buddhism, teaches uh, basically salvation through the power of Amitabha Buddha. And none of us can save ourselves. But it's not really necessary because Amitabha has promised to save us. Am Amitabha has already saved us. And uh, all we need to do is to chant Namu Amida Butsu as a sign of, well, gratefulness uh, for the fact that we are already saved. And this Koike Lunoske um, was into or is into meditation and started to meditate and visit meditation teachers both in Japan and also he went to, I think, Thailand and maybe other places to uh, participate in retreats and it helped him a lot and I think he was also writing about his progress on his blog and he got into trouble with uh, the Pure Land Buddhist headquarters um, when he wanted to take over the temple from his father they said well you can't become a pure land priest if you follow those teachings that they, you follow according to what you write on your blog so you can't meditate because meditating is basically the effort to get closer to Buddha which is also the reason why, well, I think both the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church, uh, sometimes they have problems when people who are Christians also meditate. Um, because usually in Christianity, you draw a clear line between humans and God, and you don't try to mix those. You won't, don't try to, you're not supposed to try to get closer to God. Um, the same in Pure Land Buddhism. So you leave salvation to Amitabha Buddha. You're not trying to get closer to Amitabha, Amitabha Buddha. You're not supposed <coughs> to try to become a Buddha yourself. So uh, he was told he couldn't become a Jodo Shin priest. Uh, so um, he made his temple or his father's temple become independent so that he could become the next priest. So he left uh, Jodo Shin, uh, the sect, and became the head priest of this uh, temple in Yamaguchi prefecture, which is uh, at the west end of the main island. And also he started a second small temple close to Tokyo, where he started meditation courses. And he's written lots of books in Japan as well. Um, so starting 10 years, 15 years ago. Um, and he appeared on TV. That's probably what made him most famous. There was this Buddhist boom around 10 years ago in, in uh, Japan. And they had this program called Gyoletsu no Dikiru. 
So there was this famous TV personality, Shimada Shinsuke, and he had these two programs. One was, um, maybe was something like that in, in the West as well, where people could, there were three lawyers or four lawyers, and you could ask them questions, and each lawyer would about law or something or, or divorce or, or whatever or, or traffic accidents um, and and each of the lawyers usually what what would make the program interesting each of them had two totally different opinions about who is right and wrong in that case and, uh, so basically uh, there was a case that's presented and, and people first uh, there's a, some some how do you say, uh, well, in Germany we call these prominente. What would be in English? Prominent is the word in English. Prominent? Well known people. Well, well known people are like celebrities, kind okay. of. Mm -hmm. Celebrity mm -hmm. kind of people. They kind of discuss about that um, and then they ask the, the lawyers. Uh, usually it's kind of right or wrong or whatever. And then usually two of them say right, two of them wrong. And then they're everybody's surprised. Well, how? <laughs> whatever that was one of these programs and the other one was um, the same with Buddhists that started yeah. later or Buddhist monks like, like where people could ask questions mm -hmm. about well either Buddhism or life in itself and there were four or five Buddhists that would give their point of view and he was one of these mm -hmm. um, he's a kind of yeah well funny character in that he resembles I don't think we have this type right now here at Antaji but this type of pr practitioner that also comes to, to Antaji very serious very also introverted mm. sometimes they seem as if they have no desires at all, so so probably he, he was very thin, so probably he was not not eating much. Probably had didn't wasn't that guy who said that after two weeks or so now I need a beef steak or I want to eat delicious ramen. So I want to eat go to Watanabe Suisan also. Um, rather the, the the kind of guy who on a hosan, if he has time, would sit in his room alone and, and meditate for an extra two hours or so. <coughs> Um, yeah, almost like, like the perfect hermit, the perfect hermit. Um, like I saw him only once on, on TV, I saw this program once, but um, obviously the, the time that they had told him that the program would last or the, the time they would need to broadcast, uh, how do you say, to film the <laughs> program was longer than, than they told him. So he would get up in the middle of the program and say, I have to leave now because my meditation class is starting. <laughs> For the rest of the program, there was this one vacant spot. <laughs> he had just disappeared because he had this, I don't know, Friday uh, weekend class or so. And everybody else was like, oh. Doesn't he know this kind of golden time TV now? <laughs> he, he cannot go. But, but for him, it was completely normal. In a way, it was, was really cool. Um, and last year, at some point uh, last year, he says, I'm gonna. Well, he was a monk already in, in, in the. Or he was acting as a priest in his temple. But he says, Well, I'm gonna. Uh, leave home once more so he I don't know what he did with this temple in western Japan but I think tried to sell this house that he had in Tokyo and he stopped his meditation classes and he was basically um, living like a homeless just just uh, traveling barefoot around Japan and living in a sleeping bag um, and I didn't read these books, but there was one book uh, that he wrote with the title Gedatsu Sunzen, which means just before 
Final Nirvana. Geht dazu, es ist kind of a liberation, final liberation of the Buddha or Nirvana. So one step before Nirvana. And uh, according to the internet, according to people who know him well, um, he was saying at the time that he would need a minimum of one year, a maximum of seven more years to attain final nirvana. So he was basically entering the last stage of his spiritual quest. Um, I'm not quite sure how old he is now, it's probably in his early 40s at the time, so, so around 40. He was acting as a teacher around the age of 30. Uh, for 10 years he was acting as a meditation teacher, but then he quit that last year to enter this final stage. And again, uh, according to people who know him, he said that if you have the complete deluded person, and that's the zero, and a Buddha would be 100, then he at the time uh, located himself at 90 or so. So, so he was on, on a scale from zero, deluded person to Buddha, he was at stage 90. And you thought, I need a maximum of another seven years to climb this last 10 steps on the ladder. Um, and now that was a, a little news in Japan in the spiritual community that around two weeks ago or so, um, he called his former publisher and uh, try to reach out to his former students uh, saying that uh, well basically I was wrong I fooled myself um, I'm probably not going to become a Buddha during this lifetime and I'm not gonna teach meditation anymore all I want to do um, for the rest of my life is maybe well live together with a partner and take care of my parents in their old age mm, and i think he said something you, you can it's all in japanese of course so uh, if you look for Yunosuke, you won't find anything in english i think but um he put this also on YouTube. I don't know if he put it on YouTube uh, by himself or if it was people close to him, but um, he put this uh, voice recordings all together about uh, one and a half to two hours, I think, where he talks about um, the last six or seven months when he was traveling and the reason why he stopped um, the travels. <clears throat> and he, well, he realized that he's not going to become a Buddha. Um, one of the things he says on YouTube is um, he thought that he had already gone beyond his uh, sexual desires. So he thought he had left the sexual desires behind. But then, to his total surprise, he started to have wet dreams um, on his travels and one night after the other, which was something that didn't happen to him before. Um, now, having wet dreams is actually one of the few things concerning sexuality which are in Buddhism completely okay. So, so never has the Buddha said that you must not have a wet dream. <laughs> Everything else is basically forbidden. So you must not have sex with women, you must not have sex with men, you must not have sex with animals, you must not have sex with corpses, you must not put your sex, your dick into vegetables or whatever. It's, it's, it's really, uh, if you look through these old uh, Vinaya texts, uh, they, they basically thought, every possibility 
uh, there's this one famous case of a guy taking a nap in the park and when he wakes up there's a woman sitting on him and having sex with him and then the Buddha for some reason says well you're, you're not wrong you're not to be blamed you had a nap so <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was not your intention to have sex with this woman, so she she's at fault. You you are you're not wrong. Um, masturbation is also not allowed, but wet dreams is one of the few things which are completely okay because I mean, it's it's happening to you when you when you're sleeping. It's it's not your will is not involved in this. But I think there was a point. In the early history of Buddhism, they had these uh, four or so gatherings after the Buddha died. Uh, during the first two or so, they basically they um, decided uh, what the Buddha had said and, and um, put it down in writing. But then I think it was around the third gathering where there was a split in the early Sangha. And one of the points which they could not agree on is if an Arakan. Uh, Arakan is basically a perfectly enlightened person. Still has wet dreams or not. So one group said even an Arakan sometimes still has wet dreams and another person says no, an Arakan is completely liberated. So an Arakan should not have uh, wet dreams and if he does then he's not an Arakan. Um, and I'm not really familiar with Southern Theravada Buddhism, which, which of these two is now the dominant view. But it seems that uh, this person, Koike Nyunoske, was well surprised and, and um, also then devastated that he would have wet dreams. And one night after the other means I can't be at 90 um, if I still have wet dreams. Then, um, well, as he was walking barefoot around the country and, and camping in his um, sleeping bag, um, sometimes when it was raining on the roof of a house uh, came that people call, called the police and, and, and he was stopped by the police and questioned by the police. And he thought that he was already so detached from himself that that wouldn't really move. But then he felt that, well, this loneliness of being there on the street and, and the, nobody there knows him. There's, there's a guy on uh, pretty famous in, in Japan, I think two years ago or so, there was a two-year-old uh, two kid that got lost somewhere in the mountains and uh, they were looking rescue. I don't know what Maybe it's, uh, it's half, half a year ago, maybe it's one and a half years ago. I think it was in the summer week because we saw it on TV in Kyushu. A two year old boy got lost in the mountains and uh, rescue people tried to find him, nobody could find him. There was this comparatively old guy who, who went into the mountain and found him um, and I think they, he said that basically he put himself in the shoes of this kid and thought well wh where would I go if I was a two year old and he went there and he found the kid um, and after that he was instantly famous and he has this red towel that he wraps around his I think he's bald also he looks bald but he has this red towel and I think now he's also traveling through Japan um, camping on the street and wherever he goes people come to to kind of hug him or shake his hands and the camera fo follows him so wherever he goes people are happy to see him and i could imagine <laughs> this guy people, wherever he goes people are kind of in japanese he would say kimoi kind of the, the, the girls say kimoi so this guy is kind of spooky or kind of <laughs> he's weird, he's weird. exactly yeah that, that's the guy who's kind of famous 
and then people love him. And, and, yeah, yeah, and, 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 and young people, old people, everybody, they want to sign, they want to shake his hand. <laughs> And, and well, that, that's the, the guy I'm talking about right now. Um, yeah, well, that, that's, that's Koi, Koi Kujuna's case. Right? Mm. Kind of a little different type of, mm. little, different type of person. Oh, you did it yeah, you did not. Tada, so no tabi o ste, so no no juku sta koto de. De, so no, ma, Koi Kujuna's case, no, so no, stotsu, jubunga gakkali sta, juka o do roita no, a musi o sta. それも連日<笑> かなしいというかそういう執着もないはずなのになんか執着がなかったというまあ参詣というのをまあ so I think quite a lot of people are so kind of surprised that this person who was so close to Nirvana now says, I won't make it in this lifetime. Um, on the other hand, you could also say, well, maybe this realization he had, maybe that is a sort of Satori. Um, Especially in the um, form of Buddhism, where it comes from, in Pure Land Buddhism. Pure Land Buddhism starts with that realization: I will never become a Buddha. That's why Amitabha Buddha has promised to save me. If I could become a Buddha by myself, there would have been no reason for Amitabha uh, to save uh, all living beings. But. <coughs> Amitabha Buddha has, especially for myself, who will never be saved through my own efforts, made this vow to save me. So in Pure Land Buddhism, this realization that I will never make it is already the thing that connects you with Amitabha. And then there's this famous um, section in the Genjo Koan, the first chapter in some editions of the Shobo Genzo, where Dogen Zenji says to awaken to delusion is what makes you a Buddha. Mayoi o daigo suduwa shobutsunali. Buddhas are those who realize that they are deluded. Not the ones that realize that they have no delusion, but the ones that realize they are deluded. Those are the Buddhas. While it's the ordinary people who delude themselves into thinking that they are enlightened. Go odaime suruwa shujo nari. Again, you could draw a parallel there. That's maybe it's those who think they've taken the red pill and now they see it clearly that are actually in delusion and those who are totally aware of their delusion but are able to live with it are actually maybe the awakened ones um, but um, well, if you're interested and you Google for this name in Japanese, you will go or you will find a um, page by the publisher Sangha, which is a Buddhist, Buddhist publisher. <coughs> they have published several of uh, Koike's books. They have also published three of my books. And one of the editors there um, relates of how he got a call in the middle of March. Uh, from uh, this Koike and well uh, Koike then says sorry um, 
I was, well, basically I was lying to you when I said that I'm close one step to Nirvana. I realized actually I'm far away from Nirvana. Um, so in a way you could say that realization is good realization, but what I found strange in there is what the editor said is that when Koike talked to him on the telephone, he said, I thought I was already at 90 and I had only 10 more steps to climb so that I get to perfect nirvana. When we first met a couple of years ago, I was 28. And last autumn, I thought I was 90, but actually what I now realize, I'm still at 30. Um, which for Koike is probably a big well, surprise and then a reason for this, uh, in Japanese it's called Sange. How do you say in, in English? In, in German we would say Beichte or Reue. Uh, confession? confession, yeah, confession. So, uh, so, so basically, he, he calls his editor and says, I have to confess something. I thought I was at 90, actually, I'm only at 30. And in his mind, as several years passed from the time when he was at 28, and now he's at 30. So, even if he had, should live for another 50 years, he will never get to 100 in this lifetime. But for me, at that point, it's clear that his realization is quite different from what Dogen Zenji says when he says realizing delusion is what makes you a Buddha. Because realizing delusion means that you let go of this yardstick with which you measure where you are from 0 to 100. In the world where that comparison is possible, which means in this discriminative world where we all have names and we all have passports and we all have different weight and a different length. In that world, we are never be enlightened we we'll always be limited human beings. And when you realize that, you let go of that yardstick. So when you say, actually, I'm not at 90, I'm still at 30, you're still clinging to that yardstick. That's what kind of, well, surprised me or, or made me think, oh, not a big difference to where he was last autumn when he was when he still thinks he's at 30. It's just that when we have this realization of being deluded and being deluded for the rest of ourselves The, well, the important thing is someone has this realization. This realization is coming from somewhere. And this realization itself is beyond comparison. And this realization cannot be measured with this yardstick from 0 to 100. The, the, the moment you realize, I am deluded. I am this deluded person. I am this muho with all his failure, failures and with his desires and everything. But the person who realizes this is also at the same time beyond. So uh, that's kind of what, well, surprised me about Koike that he still 
well, obviously attached to the idea that he, well, he's somewhere there in the 30 area. Another thing is the, well, the confession itself. You can, well, listen to it by yourself on YouTube. Mm. Me personally, so when I listen to what Koike has to say, um, For my, for example, in my case, um, especially during the first years after I started with Zen practice, um, there were a lot of small revelations and Whenever I sat in the beginning, it felt special, completely different from the rest of the day when I didn't sit. It always felt good or at least felt worth my time. I never regretted to sit and it never felt as if it wouldn't make a difference. It always made a difference. And I felt as if I made progress and when I came to Antaisi I felt that I would or I thought that I would make even more progress because now I would have much more time to sit I would have uh, 1800 hours per year to sit and I would have my daily uh, not only my daily practice but also my monthly session And again, because it was so intense in the beginning, it was hard as well. But once I realized, oh, I can do this. Again, this realization was a great realization. Oh, I can do this. And with each session, it gets a little easier. And at first I couldn't even sit in half lotus. Even in the Burmese pot posture moving around. But then at one point I finally I can sit in half lotus. And then eventually I could at least during the uh, four hours during the day I could sit in full lotus. Wow, now I can do that. But... What was missing was, well, this great breakthrough, the answer to all the questions, this, this final thing that I came for. There was little steps forward, but there wasn't this big breakthrough, well, becoming a Buddha. Nirvana. Mm. But then, well, there's this episode that episode that I often talk about uh, dying on the third day of the session. Um, completely letting go even if it should cost my life and realizing it's not me but there's Sazen that's doing Sazen for me and 
around that time, mm, I also sometimes had these mm, well, revelations or periods that remind me of what people tell uh, who have participated in Nikon retreats. Do you know about Nikon? No. So I think uh, in Jodo Shin Buddhism, in Pure Land Buddhism, usually they don't um, meditate, but there's this one meditation style that was um, invented or developed by, uh, I think, by, I think, uh, by uh, Pure Land Buddhists, I think. What they do there is, um, they put you into separate rooms or put you into a corner of a room and uh, you have a, how do you say that? Uh, partition. Pardon? Partition. Partition, yeah. Um, so, so basically you're, you're isolated for several days and um, you're told to um, focus on maybe on the first day from when you were born until age four and then from age four to age eight, from age eight to age 12 and so forth. And uh, during that time of your life, you're focused on, show, supposed to focus on the question, um, what have my parents, my mother and my father done for me? Um, what have I done for my parents? And what, have I done that have caused my parents trouble? Well, what in Japanese would be mewaku. So, so what mewaku have I caused for my parents? And what good have I done for my parents? And what good have my parents done for me? Um, and one question that you could also ask, but which is not asked is, well, what have, what mewaku have my parents caused for me? which is sometimes what we are very obsessed with, or which is also what psychoanalysis some focus a lot on. Like when I was young, my mother did this to me, my father did this for me. That's something that they don't ask in Nikon. It's, it's uh, the other way around. So how much of a pain in the ass was I, were, were I for my parents and how much good have I done for them? And how much good do they have, have done for me? And then also later in life, you broaden that and, and also focus on other people. And basically what you realize then is you really haven't done much for anybody. Especially when, it, when you compare that to what other people have done to you, especially when you focus on, on your parents, compared to what uh, sacrifices uh, your parents have done for you, that's really not so much you have done for your parents. And then if you also put into calculation what trouble you caused for them. Um, yeah, you're really ashamed. And I never participated in a Nikon retreat, but also in the Zen, when you realize, or when I realized, wow, I'm sitting here, um, I'm sitting here. And while I'm sitting here, the Tenzo is making the meals, the meals, are they on the table? Uh, there's a room for me. There's a futon ready for me in the closet. I didn't make that futon. It was already there for me when I came to Antalya. And all these years before I came to Antalya and also, also these years and months I spent in Antalya, most of the time I was complaining. I was complaining about this, I was complaining about that, I was complaining about my Dharma brothers, about my superiors, about uh, this and that. 
the work, the weather. And I wasn't missing a thing. I wasn't missing a thing. <coughs> and at that time, I felt like I wanted to confess, but I never confessed And that I would kind of well, go on the internet or actually call somebody and say, hey, I've been lying to you. It was not me who was doing the Zen. The Zen was doing the Zen through me. Um, so that's also a little bit, I mean, maybe I'm too much of a kind of cynical person, but when I listen to these YouTube talks of, of Koikesan. At one point I understand, I understand, uh, or I think, at least I think I understand where he's coming from and what happened there. But then to go on the internet with it, and then even to say I was at 28, now I'm at 30 on the scale to enlightenment. There's something wrong, something smells wrong there to me. Um, probably I think Sawaki also says, said that somewhere in the quotes where we, that we read in the winter kind of, a confession can also sometimes be like some kind of makeup that you put on to uh, you put on the show by saying oh i'm such a bad person i'm such a bad person i'm such a bad person but you don't really think you're a bad person hey look at me what a good boy i am saying that i'm bad i'm so sorry i'm so sorry i confess um Well, the reason why I spent so much time talking about Koike Yunosuke is because, well, it's a perfect example of this contemplative who could, well, lead at least some people completely astray, while for others he's a complete bore. Um, The koan for us who are sitting here right now is mm. how much are we willing to give of ourselves? And if you want to give all, you need to follow. And it's not enough to just follow an inner voice or an inner glow. You have to follow others. Sometimes what others say is obviously not the best thing. Even in such a case, sometimes, if it's not so bad, if it's just that it's not the most, say, intelligent way to do the job, you can say, still say, okay, let's do it like that. And just um, for the sake of it, as a form of practice, do it like this. Sometimes if it's really dangerous and uh, there are life at stakes, You also have to let go of this idea of unconditional, unconditional obedience and say, hey, maybe this is dangerous. <coughs> On the other hand, I think we shouldn't yeah, delete, delude ourselves into thinking that, well, we are the ones who have taken the red pill and we know exactly uh, where we're going and whom to follow, basically, our own idea, what is right and wrong. 
אוקיי. So much from my side. Um, you might, uh, so I already read that uh, small last portion of the Shobo Genzuzi Monkey. Um, you might also want to check with the last chapter of the Gakudo Yojinchu. And if your Japanese is good enough and you're interested in it, you could also Google for Koikem Yunosuke. And you find some material on him as well. Um, okay, so much from my side for today. If you have any questions, please feel welcome to ask. Um, you mentioned there was something you picked up on three years ago with the Sangha, which is why you chose to yes. give this talk. Um, was there something specific now that you picked up on that you chose to, to do the same? Mm, probably it was less in the Sangha than basically this uh, thing happening uh, Koike Yunosuke topic coming up. Um, so probably you never heard of him, but as he's a trade name in Japan, so, so that's something that uh, came up. So, so a lot of people right now on Twitter or, or in, the, in, the, in the internet are kind of discussing, well, what went wrong or did anything went wrong, maybe. That was actually a great realization. As you said, as I said, you you can also interpret that as a huge realization. I'm a deluded person. Um, but it applies, I think, to a certain degree also to ourselves. I mean, we're here for practice and even though we might not call it nirvana i mean we have some goal or some idea what we want um, for example well the state of non-doing we want to practice uh, non-doing but how do you do that and Right now, among the four of you, I don't see that type, but in, in the past <coughs> over and over again, there were people here that were more serious than the rest, but they were slightly off. Their mind was always slightly off. And I had the feeling they were in Antaiji mainly because it was convenient for them to practice here because, well, they had this minimum of 1,800 hours and they had three meals a day. Um, they had a certain amount of Samu, but not too much. But they didn't come for spiritual guidance. because they thought they already knew where, where they were, they, where they were heading. Um, which in a way is kind of not so bad because in, in what I write in the adult practice paper papers is that, that well, you shouldn't hang on your, on your teacher like kids hangs on their parents and always, well, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? Please te tell me what the practice is about. It's your practice. It's your practice. And you should know why you have come here. If you don't know, then even your teacher can't tell you why am I here. 
if you do don't give if you don't give that question if you don't give the answer to that question who's supposed to answer that question on the other hand if you don't have ears to listen and that's sometimes that, that happens that people are so sure that they know what they want to do and they are so sure why they are here they already have that question answered in their mind that you can't even reach them anymore then why live together in the sangha other questions Steve I'm sort of interested in the uh, whether or not we've taken the red pill or still living in delusion or whether we've woken mm. up or not how do we sort of like not that I think I have this problem but then I think oh yeah I'm practicing the right way but maybe other people think this person's practicing the wrong way how do you sort of differentiate between what's what I mean you said it's hard to tell but I think as long as you realize I'm not that perfect, I'm actually more deluded than I thought I am, you're on the right track. Just like, like Sawaki also says in the text that we studied in the winter, when you sit in the Zen, you become very aware of your illusions or of that kind of bug that bites you on the testicles. When you were, dan when you were dancing with a geisha, uh, you forgot about that. And, and some people complain that during the Zen they have more disturbing thoughts than usual. But it's, it's not that because of the Zen your disturbing thoughts increase. It's be become more clear and settled and you see, the, see this stuff more clearly so um, when you have doubts if you're really progressing or not then I think you're on the right track while on the other hand you think oh I'm going the right way everything is getting better every day and I'm, I'm well I was at 39 40 50 uh, slowly but steadily I'm rising then maybe something is wrong But if you're not so sure, and that doesn't, that doesn't mean that you kind of phone all your friends and here yeah, I'm such a bad guy, I'm such a failure, I'm, I'm wasted, I wasted two years of my life in Antalya. I don't mean that exaggerated form of, of being not sure about what you do, but more like. I mean, that's, that's kind of what, what I found a little bit strange with the Matrix film. These, these red pill guys are too sure about themselves. Mm. Too sure that, that they know the answer. Mm. And with uh, Total Recall, well, in the end, Schwarzenegger also seems to be sure that, well, he belongs on Mars. But there's still room for doubt there. And that's what, what I like about this movie that made me maybe actually he was brainwashed just like people get brainwashed brainwashed into ISIS and they think that well ISIS is, is fighting for the right cause but maybe one day they wake up from that dream or we are the, the ones that are brainwashed and maybe in 50 years we are all Muslims and we think back oh, oh at that time I was brainwashed into Zen Buddhism at city <laughs> then and, and thought I had all the answers but now finally I'm, I'm here you say up to Allah, whatever. <laughs> 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 uh, no, no, 
disrespect as, as uh, intended. Yeah, but yeah, as long as you have doubts, I think you're on the right track. はい、あの、メールで届きました。